Um, okay, so now I'm going to talk more about messages in MPI and in particular first lecture at a point to point messages. So I think tomorrow or later on today, I can't quite remember when uh, we're going to be talking about collectives, but for now it's point to point. So um, in a message in MPI, um, it will contain a number of elements of some sort of data types. Usually it will contain um, an array of some description. Um, and this can be a basic type, so like real integer, um, or derived types, so like um, a combination of reals and integers in some kind of structure. Um, yeah, and derived types are basically made up from basic, um, basic types. Um, and in C and Fortran, you need to use slightly different um, types because C and Fortran don't necessarily have to use exactly the same uh, sizes of bits for each type of variable. Um, so in C, we've got the following types. There's an MPI car, just a basic sign character in C. Um, short for short integer. Um, MPI int, long sign car. So all these different types you can get. In, in C, and this MPI packs down at the bottom, which is a more complicated thing, which I think we should point to in these lectures. And then in Fortran, it's much the same. You've got a particular type for each basic data type um, that you have. In Fortran, it's integer, real, double precision, complex, logical, and characters. Here, a MPI character just counts as a single character, not a string, <coughs> because in Fortran, you can create string, which is, a, which is a type character as well. Yep, so now going on to point-to-point -point communication. Uh, so this, as David spoke about previously, is really just sending a message from one, from one process to another. So there's nothing collective, it's just basic point. Um, and you, you identify processes by the rank. So you'd say I'm sending something from rank zero to rank two. Uh, so in this, the sender calls some sort of send. There are different types of send, which we'll talk about later. Um, and then the receiver calls <coughs> the receive, um, like some spanner. Um, and as well as the data itself, there's a small header with some extra information, uh, which is called the status. So there are four main types of send and one receive. So there's a asynchronous send, which is as David said previously, it's like if you make a phone call, you basically pick your phone up, dial, wait until the other person pick, wait until the other person picks up speaking and when you finish put it down. So this essentially sits and waits until the message is received on the other end. There's a buffered send, which is like sending an email. You just send send the message away and then keep going as if nothing's changed. There's a standard send, which is somewhat undefined. Um, it depends on your specific MPI implementation, but usually it's buffered unless your message is very big or there are lots of messages waiting and then it will become synchronous. So these ones you have to be a bit careful with because they can either be synchronous or buffered. So you, if you work on the assumption that it's buffered, you can sometimes get deadlocked. Sometimes this will switch to being synchronous. Then there is a ready send which always completes um, and doesn't really care if anything ever picks it up. Um, so these are, oh, and they receive, it's just they receive. So these are the names of the functions or subroutines, depending if you see your Fortran, um, which you would use. So MPI send is a standard send, as I said before, it's somewhat undefined. It can be either buffered or synchronous. So just be careful with using that one because its behavior can change. If your code is written well, and if your code basically works on the assumption that all your sends are going to be synchronous, then MPI send is completely fine. Um, then there's synchronous send, buffered send, and ready send, and then the receive. Is there actually any reason you want to use a standard send for a specified? 
not really. So I think basically when they wrote um, MPI, I mean, there are lots of weird and wonderful types of sounds and, and, and receives. Because someone somewhere has gone, oh, it'd be quite nice if it did this. So there's a type of there's a type of receive, which is non-blocking. But at the end of the day, you've still got to wait at some point to make sure it's received. So I mean, some people like that functionality, but fundamentally, you still have to receive it at the end of the day. So yeah, I'm, I think it's more send is just there for convenience because sometimes buffer is a bit faster because then you can get on to doing something else um, if you have to wait. But it's yeah, it's a, it, one of the problems with buffered send is you've usually got some internal buffer hidden inside MPI somewhere. So if you can imagine, if you filled that buffer up, so you send off lots of sends, but nothing goes out and receives them, that will eventually fill up, and then your code will just fall over. But whilst with the MPI send, it is buffered, it is, it is usually buffered up until a point, and when that buffer is filled, it then goes synchronous. So effectively, it's, it's potentially faster and more robust than the trees are yeah. as in this case it is. Yeah, but it's undefined, so if you're... So lots of people make the mistake that they assume that a send is buffered, the standard send is buffered. And usually, that's completely fine, and they never hit any problems, but sometimes it just will end up. So I mean, it's, I, I guess it's best to write your code with synchronous sends, but if that works, then you're quite welcome to go and get rid of the, the extra X in the name of the uh, function call. Um, so yeah, so this is the um, the syntax for sends. They're basically all the same, regardless of which type of send it is. So you've got your your buffer, which is essentially whatever it is you're trying to send, whether it be some array or just a variable. Uh, count, which is the number of elements in, in that buffer. So if it's just a standard real, you'll just say a, a single number count will, will be one. If it's a, an array with 50 elements, count will be 50. Your MPI data type, which was two or three slides back, which basically says what, what type of data this is that you're sending. Um, your destination, which is the number of the bank that you're sending your, your message to. Tag, which is just like something that you can label your, your message with. Um, and then the, the communicator that you're, that you're using. Um, Fortran's exactly the same, but you've got this I error on the end. Um, and you don't need to worry about passing pointers in with Fortran. What uh, bytes equal to us? A message you use if you use a, a data type which is more than one byte long. What, what, what do you mean? If you send data from one machine to another yeah. and specify as a uh, double, yeah. how is that transfer? Is that compatible between different implementations? Or do you need to specify bytes and that same shape as like this? Uh, I guess, off the top of my head, so you're basically meaning if you've got a, a, a a heterogeneous system. Uh, I'm not quite sure. I think because you've stated what data type is, there's probably something in the header which says what engine this the system it came from is. So I think it translates, but I'm not completely sure. There's probably a special type of send which does that. Um, but yeah, so basically all this data type does is basically says how many bytes are in each individual versions, you know, if it's a integer like four bytes, just because fundamentally it's a sending bytes, it's not sending types of things. Ah uh, yes, to say we want to send some array of 10 integers, this is in C, there's a Fortran one next, uh, we basically redefine some array, <coughs> and then later we, we just send X, um, 10, which is the number of elements we want to send, MPI int because it's an integer that we're sending. Um, this, it says dash equals three, but, fun, but it, when you code it up, you just write three. So that's where it's being sent to. So rank number three. Um, and then tag is zero, so that's just some sort of label you're given this message. Most of the time, it doesn't really matter, just as long as they're consistent. 
um, and then your communicator, which is this is NPI call world. But of course, because this is an NPI code, every run or every process is running exactly the same version of the code. So if we want to write, so, so if we want to send a message from rank one to rank three, we have to explicitly first have an if statement here to make sure that only rank number one is actually sending something. And then we need um, to have some if statement down here. Sorry, no, oops. Oh yeah, and for an integer, sorry, um, where it's just a single value with C, um, we just basically have to send X, but here we have to pass in the address of X. Because if you think with a, a C array, it's really just a pointer. Um, so you just need to make sure you pass in the address if you're referring to a single value. And then in Fordran, it's the same kind of idea. <coughs> but this time, you don't really need to care about passing addresses because Fordran is all passing by representing. So what would you typically use to tag for? Uh, so say you're sending, I think it's actually covered a bit later on, but oh, say sorry. Yeah, it's fine. Say that you, um, you've got two different types of things that you're going to be sending. Um, and say, so it's only really if you're doing buffered sends and you send them in the funny order. So uh, as I'll cover later, messages are always received in the order that they're sent. Um, but say you're sending two things, two different things, A and B. So on your one processor, you like send A, send B, but on the other one, you receive B, receive A. If you tag them, so you can say tag A with one and B with two, then even if you've got them in the wrong order, it knows to pick up which message first. So I mean, te technically, because with MPI, everything is received. So because with MPI, messages will arrive in the order that they're sent, providing you're careful and sensible, there would be a problem. But if you do mix things up in coding, I guess it's just some sort of sanity checking it makes people feel more confident with what they're doing. Could it, if you specify, so you might use later, if you specify a tag on the C, it has to match with the set. It's not saying, it's not saying, skip through to the next proceed with this tag. It actually has to match what's going on. Yeah, it's just, okay. so we basically say that two messages are coming in. Then that will be, be able to let me uh, let me distinguish which one you want to steal. And there's also some wild cards as well. Like there's um, for for so uh, for receive here. There's uh, it's basically the same kind of idea. This is what you're going to be receiving. This is how many elements. This is the the type source which is where it's coming from. There's a wild card which is any source. So you can technically say just wait for a message coming in from anywhere. And then if you've got lots of different things, then you might want a tag to be able to make sure you're collecting the right sort of thing. So yeah, most of the time for a simple code, if you're if it's reasonably simple, you don't really care about tag, you're just taking zero or whatever. Yeah, specify a tag. Because um, it automatically <coughs> receives the right message. Yeah. Yeah. Right uh, so provide so I guess if you send five five messages all with the same tag from different ranks, say, and you're receiving from anywhere, then you could obviously receive the, the wrong message because it just matches tags. Um, we specify different types of different messages. And yeah. Things, uh, yeah. Always receive different type of yeah. message. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll ignore anything else. So even if you go and write a test program where you send with tag zero and receive tag one, it will just have it forever because it's waiting for a message from tag one to come through, which of course it never does. And then there's, there's this final thing here called status, which is a structure. You can see, it's just an array, um, which contains information. Essentially, contains the, the messages header. It's information about that message. Um, oh yes, yeah, so this is the, the codes if you want to receive from rank one or rank three. So you've got summary y, which you can receive this into. Um, so you want to receive y, there are 10 elements, it's an integer, it comes from rank number 1, has a tag of 0 um, on the communicator, MPI, com world, and it also returns this status, 
something which contains information on that message. And of course, we've, we've got to make sure that we are receiving it on the correct rank. Um, else, every rank is going to start listening to for this message. And then, again, for a um, scalar, whether it's an array, it's exactly the same kind of idea. But again, you want to pass the, the address in. Uh, yeah, so, so you could, if you do it the other way around, instead of saying if I'm rank 3, receive, receive many things and then check the status. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah that's that's one thing where status is is useful for is if you've done a receive from anybody, you can then look at that and find out who you actually got your message from. Yeah. Uh, and then this is the same equivalent in, in Fortran, so there's nothing vastly different. Um, so in terms of where you've got synchronous, um, because a, a receive is always blocking, um, whether you are blocking on the send, it just depends on what kind of send that you're sending. Um, and so that's one way to synchronize your code is if you use blocking send, because uh, you know as soon as that's been sent and received, both processes are in the sync. <coughs> uh, so for a communication to work, um, you obviously need to send it to something that exists, um, and you must receive it to something that exists. Um, it must be on the same communicator, uh, and the tags must match. Um, the message types must match as well, so if you're sending um, five integers or but you're receiving 500 um, characters, then you'll get some sort of error. And your receiver's buff buffer has to be large enough. So if you're sending 5 million integers, but your receive buffer is only 10 integers long, then it's going to crash because you're basically well, basic a, a, a segmentation problem because it's trying to dump more memory into something in memory that's not allowed to, not, not allowed to access. Uh, yes, here are these world cars I talked about um, before. So um, you can receive from any source, so from any rank in that communicator that you specified, and you can also receive any tag if you want. And then you can look at these statuses, at, at the status parameters and find out what, what these are. So essentially, what a status is like is you've got some sort of envelope which comes through, which contains your message, one of the bits of paper in this envelope is just a kind of small kind of header saying who it's going to and what the kind of data is that there is in the address and there's a bit of information. And then also contained in this envelope is all the data that's actually sent. <coughs> so this is essentially what this status is. Um, so you can look at things such as the, the source um, rank um, or the, the tag that came with, or the count, so how many elements are in this. This count can be useful because, say, you you don't necessarily always have to send and receive the same amount of data. So, say, I'm not very sure of some example where you might want to use it, but you could, say, have some receive buffer which is 10 elements long, but your sender only sends two elements. That's completely fine. Um, because it's because your receive buffer is big enough. But say that your sender could send a variable number of elements, hopefully less than 10, or you get some kind of <coughs> segmentation fault, then you can basically go in there and look and see just how many things were actually sent. <coughs> uh, yeah, so if you receive messages, um, you can get this MPI get count, which is a function which you used in the previous slide. Uh, yeah, so like source and tag, you can basically just extract from the um, from status um, as uh, for the C1 as something inside the structure, or that is one of the um, one of the elements of the array. But this count is actually a separate function which you just use. So it's basically get count status data type, and it returns the count.
it's also, as I said earlier, messages don't overtake each other. So if you send five messages um, in, the, in the order of A, B, C, D, E, then these will be received in the order of A, B, C, D, E. And this is true for non-synchronous sends as well. So if you just fire off lots of buffered sends, these will be received in the same order. Um, now, obviously, I say if you're sending from, say, rank zero sends to one, an entity or an entity, then, then to four, and that doesn't really matter which order, which time, which ones will receive things. But if you send to the same rank, if you send five messages to the same rank, these messages will arrive at that rank in the order that you send them. So here's an idea of what you want to do with your um, tags. So say rank zero synchronous sends um, tag one and tag two. So these two messages in this order, then rank one will receive tag one and then tag two. Say that we say that we swap this round with synchronous sends. This is now going to deadlock because we're sending a message with tag equals one, but then we're receiving first from tag is two, but this will not finish until it's been received. But this doesn't want to receive that message because that message has the, the wrong tag. So this is going to deadlock. But if you do a case with buffers, okay, so first, in this case with buffers, um, we buffered send, we've sent two things, message one and message two, but they've both got the, the same tag. But we receive one and two, and this is fine, this is guaranteed that this one is going to receive one and this one is going to receive two because it receives in the order that we've sent. But if we switch them round, so we send one and then send two, but we receive two, then receive one, because these are buffered sends, and because we tagged them, these will arrive to the correct ones. But in terms of orders, this is coming to this rank. It will have come in in the order one and two, but it will basically just be sitting in the inbox waiting to be read. Uh, so then here, if we do it in this with this wildcard MPI any tag, so we send one and send two, then we're going to receive one and receive two from that order. Uh, yeah, so um, if you receive multiple messages in the inbox, then they're going to appear in the same order. Uh, unless you you have got tags to essentially sort them, then you will get these in the same order. Uh, I thought there were more slides. Uh, okay, so now uh, we'll be starting an exercise which has some communications, which is calculated pi, um, and it's based on how to um, divide your your work up based on the rank of your processor. Um, and you have and you're sending messages as well, so this actually can be useful. Uh, and just some notes that you can read on board saying that um, the, the N that's being used um, in the example is talking about the, so is talking about the the number of of iterations that you use, not the number of processes. Or processes. Um, and in theory, this code should be able to run n number of processes if you want, um, within reason. Oh, yeah. And then just another quick thing to talk about, um, there are timers which you can use in, in MPI to time things. Um, so there's this function called MPI W time, which returns a double precision number, which is in seconds. So if you want to time something, so time however long it takes to do a certain number of calculations, you would do T1 is equal to MPIW time, and then have your code, and then at the bottom, T2 is MPIW time. And then the, the time it takes to complete this would be two, T2 minus T1. So you can use this to uh, measure the execution time. 
And actually, this is one of the only places where you would actually want to use a buffer, just not buffer, a, a barrier, just to make sure that everything is synchronized prior to starting some calculation step. So, because as David said previously, if you use um, sends and receives, these kind of naturally synchronize everything because nothing can happen until something's been received. But sometimes if you're wanting to time a particular block of code, it's useful to stick a barrier just before and just afterwards to make sure everything starts at the same time and finishes at the same time. So that's one of the few cases where you might actually want to use a barrier. And yeah, that's it. So does anyone have any questions?